Now, now what we're going to talk about is uncommon location of ectopic pregnancies. Okay? So the first one I want to talk about is interstitial ectopic pregnancy. That represents about, so they are in the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube as it joins with the endometrium at the, at the corner of the uterus. And the reason, they represent about 2 to 4% of all ectopic pregnancy, but the reason they are dangerous is that they tend to have a delayed presentation with more advanced gestation. And because they are very large vessels in this area and they're supplied by uterine artery, there is a high risk of life threatening hemorrhage when the pregnancy ruptures. These are the patients that may go, you know, become hypovolemic and hypotensive very, very quickly. So they have a higher, higher morbidity and mortality compared to the other ectopic pregnancies. So let's just show some examples. So this is a, a, actually an example of interstitial ectopic pregnancy that was missed on the uh, point of care for some in the ED. This is what they said. They said the patient had an abortion somewhere else. She had FHM on, on the uh, ED ultrasound, but the patient wasn't doing well, so they wanted a formal ultrasound. The first thing you see, again, why transabdominal ultrasound is so helpful, there's a large amount of clot in the cul-de-sac, and you do see this pregnancy, and you do see, there was a live fetus, but the pregnancy is very, very eccentric, right? And if we look on endovaginal ultrasound, you can see that there is myometrium on one side, but no myometrium on this side here. It's intimately related to the uterus. And there was a large amount of blood, and this patient became hypotensive very quickly, so very quickly shipped her to the OR, and she didn't indeed have an interstitial ectopic pregnancy that had ruptured. Here's her at the time of surgery. So what are the findings? Okay, you have an eccentric gestational sac, and you have the interstitial line sign, which is nicely shown on this clip where you see the endometrium and then it's, it, the corneal portion is extending towards this gestational sac here. There is no myometrium on the lateral aspect of the gestational sac. And you can see very, very large uterine vessels oftentimes. These are these patients. This is a different patient. You could see here, see ectopic pregnancy with these very, very large vessels. And you can imagine that if they rupture, the patient is going to become hypotensive very, very quickly. This is an advanced case. She was 14 weeks pregnant. And in this case, the pregnancy is eccentric, but sitting on top of the uterus, not lateral. So again, you have to be careful and recognize that this is actually not intrauterine. It is too high. And this patient was 14 weeks pregnant. Uh, she had increasing abdominal pain. The transabdominal is, I think, as good as the vaginal study to show how eccentric this ectopic pregnancy is with no myometrium on this side here. And again, she needed to have resection of a 10 centimeter corneal mass. So she needed an open laparotomy. So something about terminology, a little bit uh, uh, confusing, but the, now the OB literature recommend that we call these pregnancies interstitial and not corneal. Corneal pregnancy is reserved for pregnancy that occur in the cornea of a bicornate or septic uterus. And then there is another entity called angular pregnancy, I shouldn't say ectopic, angular pregnancy, which implants in the lateral angle of the uterus. Okay, so you have the interstitial ectopic that's in the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube. You have angular pregnancy that are too lateral, but still within the uterus. And then you have the corner pregnancy that are in the corner of a duplicated uterus. And so sometimes it's difficult to differentiate those, or 3D is maybe helpful because you can then obtain a true coronal plane. So... Um, again, the differential diagnosis here is a pregnancy in the, this is a true corneal pregnancy. It's eccentric because it's one horn of a bicornate uterus. And again, in this case, you see myometrium around the gestational sac, unlike, un, unlike the cases I just showed you. Uh, but if the diagnosis is unclear, you can get a careful follow-up or you can get a pelvic MR. 
Now, angular pregnancy is uncommon, okay? This is implantation, it's the lateral angle of the uterus, medial to the tubal uterine junction. It's technically intrauterine, but it's fraught with complications with a high risk of uterine rupture, placenta accreta, and spontaneous abortion. And what you're going to see is a gestational sac that is too lateral, but still surrounded by myometrium. And you can look for associated complications such as myometrial hematoma. And this patient was actually, she didn't want a pregnancy anyway, so she was treated with methotrexate. But we thought this was an angular pregnancy. And again, I think the 3D can help. This is a case I just showed you of, uh, of the angular pregnancy. So you can see on the 3D that it's still within the, um, the uterus, but it's just at the edge. Instead of being more central here, it's really at the edge, but there's some myometrium surrounding the sac. Whereas this is a true interstitial ectopic pregnancy, which is more eccentric, and there is no myometrium on the lateral aspect here of this ectopic interstitial pregnancy. Okay. Another less common type of ectopic pregnancy is cervical ectopic pregnancy, which are uncommon. So there's implantation in the cervix, which should remain closed. And it's really one of the main uh, differential is whether it's a spontaneous abortion, which is much more common, or cervical ectopic pregnancy. But again, these also have a massive risk of bleeding if they're not treated accurately. Uh, and their management usually methotrexate or KCL. So here, so look at some example. What you're going to see is a gestational sac within the cervix. Now, if you have a live embryo like this case, with a yolk sac, it's relatively easy to make the diagnosis. But um, you can see the hourglass deformity of the cervix. And if you're not sure whether it's a cervical ectopic or an uh, abortion in progress, you can just get a follow-up. And usually uh, with abortion, you have some change within 24 to 48 hours, whether, of course, with a cervical ectopic, the pregnancy will not move. So this is an easy example because there was a live fetus in this cervical ectopic pregnancy. This was very difficult to treat, and what they did was they did a DNC, very careful DNC, because there's a major risk of bleeding, and they, then they put a Foley in the cervix to try to tamper it, and actually this was successful. Now, what about this case? So in this case, you see this gestational sac, and there is something in it. This didn't have heart motion, and we really weren't sure whether it was a cervical ectopic with a, a you know, a embryonic demise versus an abortion. So what we did is get a follow-up ultrasound, and 24 hours later, uh, this was gone. But if, you, if you're not sure, you can do an MR. And you can see here these ectopic implantation in the cervix with the cervical close in the sagittal MR. And this was treated with um, methotrexate. Now, abdominal pregnancies are very, very uncommon. This is, I've seen only one or two examples. What happens is that there is likely a ruptured tubal ectopic pregnancy that then implants into the abdomen. What you're going to see in an empty uterus with a fetus that's separate. Oftentimes there's oligohydramnio. Some we have seen some cases that are more advanced and then MR is really great to make that diagnosis. Now another ectopic implantation that is becoming more and more common, at least in the US because of more and more C-section is a cesarean scar implantation. Technically, again, they are intrauterine, but it's still an abnormal implantation. And so what happens is that this implants into the defect right there in the lower uterine segment of previous cesarean section. And above, something to think about because some of these patients are completely asymptomatic and you may be the first one you know, making that diagnosis. So what you're going to see, as you can see here, is that there is a sac that is basically implanted into the C-section score. So it's a little bit... It's too low an implantation, but unlike cervical ectopic, it's a little bit more superior and oriented anteriorly towards the bladder, where the C-section score normally is. 
And what you want to see is that there is, if the pregnancy grows, there is basically no myonutrient between the, the pregnancy and the bladder. And again, sometimes it's easier to see, I think, on the trans abdominal, where you can see here, this is a patient with a history of low, she, she had a history of a prior myomectomy and C-section. She came for routine dating. She was totally asymptomatic. And you can see here the abnormal implantation of the gestational sac with no myometrium between the trophoblastia and the bladder. And at laparotomy, you could see this ectopic pregnancy protruding into the surgical defect. Again, another example, same thing. And if you're not sure the G1 wants to plan for treatment, you can see on the MR, again, implantation in the C-section scar with no myometrium, you know, or very thin myometrium between the bladder and the gestational sac. Now, ovarian ectopic pregnancy is incredibly rare. This is the only case I've ever seen. So I always say, if you see a mass in the ovary, it's not going to be an ectopic pregnancy. It's going to be a corpus sudum. This is the only exception I've seen uh, of this lesion that was intimately related to the ovary. There is a uh, yolk sac here. and But that's really the only example I've ever seen. So I think they are incredibly uncommon. Something that's not as uncommon is heterotopic pregnancy where you have an intrauterine pregnancy with an ectopic pregnancy. It's more common in patients treated for, for infertility. And the challenge, again, is that remember I said if you have an intrauterine pregnancy and a patient is pregnant, you can breathe easy, except in these cases. So what you're going to see is not only you're going to see an intrauterine pregnancy, but you're also going to see an exome mass separate from the ovary. And, of course, always look for blood in the pelvis or hemoperitoneum. And we really have to have a high index of suspicion in this patient. Any patient who is pregnant, even if you see an IUP, but there is blood in the pelvis, or the patient's an unusual amount of pain, you should think very carefully and look very carefully in the adnexa. And of course, it's a management challenge as well, because you want to try, most of these patients are fertility patients, and so you want to try to save the viable intrauterine pregnancy. So a couple of examples. Patient who has IVF abdominal pain, so she has an IUP, but she has complex fluid in Moisson's pouch, she has the liver, and so she has hemoperitoneum. And so we look around very carefully, and here's her ectopic pregnancy. So she had an IUP with an ectopic pregnancy, and fortunately, they were able to take out this ectopic pregnancy, and her IUP remained uh, viable. And finally, can we diagnose rupture of ectopic pregnancy? Basically, the, the bottom line is that you really cannot. If you see a lot of free fluid or free blood, that's a better predictor. But basically what I always say, if I see a lot of fluid in the pelvis or even moisture in spot, it could be rupture. It means the tube is actually busted or just leaking. The, the pregnancy itself is bleeding and the blood is coming out the uh, fimbriated end of the fallopian tube. And basically, probably doesn't matter because if there's a large amount of blood in the abdomen, this patient will need to go to the OR. Okay, so this was a large 8 centimeter hematosalpines with large amount of blood in the pelvis. And... This was a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And the other thing, the important, we should have mentioned that the mass was too large to be uh, removed lap easily from laparoscopy. This patient is an unfortunate girl who was pregnant with large amount of blood, tons of blood, as you can see. Here's her ectopic pregnancy. And although it, for all the world, looked like it's a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, in her case, it was just unruptured the bleeding from the fibrillin at end, and she had gross amount of hemoperitoneum. So in the end, when you do the ultrasound report, it really should be geared to guide management because there are four potential management strategies. Uh, so you're going to look at the size of the adnexal mass, the presence of cardiac activity, the presence and amount of abdominal and pelvic blood, and if you need a follow-up, you should, you should recommend it because... Basically, there are several things that can happen. Occasionally, we've seen spontaneous resolution of ectopic pregnancy. And so this patient has a very small mass with low ACG, of course, no embryonic uh, heart motion, and 
perhaps less vascularity on color dopplerophy, that's kind of questionable. And these patients sometimes may be just swallowed if the pregnancy is very small and left to be resolved on its own. Or, of course, you can take with methotrexate, which is now, fortunately, one of the very common uh, things we can offer to these patients, avoid surgery on their fallopian tube, provided that the adnexal mass is smaller than 4 centimeters and there is no embryonic cardiac activity. It's also the management of choice for this unusual location of ectopic pregnancy, such as cervical ectopic pregnancy or interstitial ectopic pregnancy, if they're diagnosed early enough. And then, of course, either laparoscopy or laparotomy is reserved for patients who are hemodynamically unstable or have very large ectopic pregnancy or have embryonic cardiac activity or have failed methotrexate therapy. And finally, or interventional, occasionally, again, in this unusual ectopic pregnancy, you can either offer methotrexate or sometimes KCL injection to, to basically do and you know, kill the embryo, or you can also offer uterine artery embolization.